close your eyes and imagine a farm scene. Most would be unlikely to picture a cityscape. Still fewer would place that farm in one of North America's most profound urban slums. Vancouver's Soul Food Street Farm ahead on Wide Angle. Despite the obvious need to feed an expanding population, 50 acres of prime agricultural land is paved over and developed every hour in North America. This at the same time that opioid addiction and overdoses have reached epidemic proportions. Could answers to both challenges be the same? Joining me from his home in British Columbia with some hopeful responses to that question is Michael Abelman, one of the early visionaries of the organic and urban agriculture movements. He is the co-founder and director of Soul Food Street Farms in Vancouver, British Columbia, and has worked on and advised dozens of similar projects throughout North America and the Caribbean. Michael is also the author of four books, including most recently, Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier. Welcome to Wide Angle, Michael. Nice to be with you. Pleasure, pleasure to have you. Um, let, let's, let's start out, if we can, with what might be considered a contradictory phrase, yeah? Um, urban agriculture. When, when you started out, I gather, back in the 1980s, people didn't really think to put those two words in the same idea. You did. What, um, what moved you to combine them? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's it's true that in the early and mid 1980s, if you use the words urban and agriculture in the same sentence, it was uh, sounded like somewhat of a contradiction. Yeah. Um, you know, I had been um, noticing some interesting trends in uh, many low income neighborhoods throughout North America. Uh -huh. uh, there were numerous abandoned lots, uh, throngs of people without work and an almost complete lack of access to fresh food. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the supermarkets had essentially fled uh, those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what, you know, I, I mm -hmm. thought I had uh, at the time a big idea, mm -hmm. and that was what if we could put those things together? What if we could take those abandoned lots, clean them up, uh, and uh, employ people to grow food for their communities? And so in the, I think it was the mid-1980s, I started the Center for Urban Agriculture with the intent of, um, of exploring that realm. And we started in um, a fairly well-known neighborhood uh, in Los Angeles called Watts. Right. Um, we started on three acres, home of the for former home of the Watts Health Clinic, which was burned down in 1965 during the, mm. the uprisings right. at that time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we removed uh, thousands of pounds of trash and rubble and dead animals and needles. And we um, hmm. uh, essentially, uh, with local youth, we planted that, uh, that three acres in a very productive uh, food farm. Yep. Uh, we learned some hard lessons, uh, not the least of which is that what a dangerous thing it is to think you know what other people need. Mm. You know, if, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you haven't noticed my skin is not black or brown. Right. Right. I'm not from that neighborhood, so. Right. So, um, uh, but you know, I've you know, if you fast forward uh, many years later and 1,400 miles north, now we're, I think we're doing something that's a little more grounded. Yeah. Uh, with a better foundation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and and exactly fast forward, I think it's it's 2009, when you and uh, a friend. Uh, break ground, as it were, on soul food in Vancouver. Um, the goals, the goals that you had in mind were several. Yeah, I gather one was to simply grow grow food, good good food in an urban setting, um, feed the neighborhood, feed feed people who lived in the neighborhood, uh, provide jobs to people who didn't have steady employment, um, teaching people to farm. And grow food for themselves, amongst other other goals, I gather. You mm -hmm. obviously you you settled on on certain things, and and probably not on others. What were what were the mission? What were the goals? And what was the mission that you settled on for for Soul Food? Yeah, well, first of all, some context. I mean, the um, the neighborhood that we're working in is unlike any neighborhood 
possibly anywhere in North America. Mm -hmm. um, it's about uh, a 15 square block area, which is entirely inhabited by folks who are dealing with uh, long-term addiction, mental illness, material poverty. It is the poorest postal code in the country, yeah. located in one of the most prosperous cities in the yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty strange. Yeah. And so uh, with that context, um, you know, our, you know, we began meeting with a number of social service agencies uh, when we, before we started, yeah. and they wanted to do everything. I mean, you know, beautify the neighborhood, feed the community, provide jobs, on and on and on. Sure. In the end, what we determined was the most important goal, mm -hmm. and I'm really glad that we landed on this, mm -hmm. um, was the jobs, was meaningful employment. Yeah. Um, a secondary goal is uh, for me personally and, and beyond myself is to provide what I call a credible model of uh, urban agriculture. There's, the terms are being used quite loosely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all around the world. Most of wh what is being called urban agriculture is not very agricultural. It's more like garden scale, which is okay, which is good. It's mm -hmm. not a value job. But I really wanted to demonstrate, was it possible? How many people could you employ uh, how much food could you produce on on uh, medium to small plots on pavement or on uh, restored uh, contaminated land in the city? Is this possible? Right. right. But in the end, our primary goal is a social one. Okay. Yep. And uh, we're employing people who are dealing with some pretty big stuff. Right. And uh, the results of that meaningful employment have been profound. Right. Right. Um, as you say, certainly by by the by your farm's very design, you're working with people with long-term drug addictions, with uh, mental health issues. Um, not, uh, I suppose, people would imagine that people struggling with those challenges are not necessarily um, the most likely to return to a job day in and day out. So I guess uh, one of the challenges I imagine you've dealt with is deciding um, how much soul food is to be run as a, a business and how much soul food is to be run as a, a social mission that obviously allows for people um, showing up and not showing up. And maybe, I don't know, if you, if you go out and look for people on, on certain days if they don't show up. Yeah, how, how did you navigate the, those sorts of uh, tensions? Yeah, that's a big one. I mean, in many ways, the two goals, the agricultural one and the social one, uh, don't always agree with each other. They right. rub up against each other. Right. You know, right. the truth is that on a given day, uh, you know, it could be a Friday, which is a big harvest day, and there's a truckload of food to be harvested. Mm -hmm. Uh, and inevitably, there are people who don't show up. Right. Um, this is the uh, this is an accepted reality of the social component of what we've set up. Right. Uh, if somebody disappears for a week or two into their addiction, when they return, the question is not, where have you been? Mm -hmm. The question is, how are you doing? Those are two very different questions. You sure. know? And we have just had to create a, uh, a system with lots of backup and uh, that allows us to accommodate for the fact that people aren't always going to be showing up, and when they are, they're not always going to be at the top of their game. You know? Right, right. Uh, uh, but, you know, for me, as a, you know, I've worked professionally as a commercial organic farmer for 43 years. Mm. This has been a big adjustment sure. um, because the farmer part of me wants to, we're here to produce food, right? Right, right. Um, we have a business to run, um, but in the end, I've had to accept and to learn that really, uh, we're here to grow people more than we are mm. to carrots and tomatoes and beans and melons. Right. All right. And if we could, let's go back to, to Soul Food Street Farm, um, thinking of, uh, a f an urban farm in the shadow of, for instance, the image that I have in mind is of the, the Rogers Arena in Vancouver. So can, can you give uh, viewers, Michael, uh, a, a, an idea of what it is like, how logistically one tackles the challenge 
of farming in on, for instance, uh, a, a parking lot? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, uh, you know, we're the scale is unusual. It's um, fairly significant. We are farming on about four acres of what is primarily pavement, right? Uh, using an innovative box system that we designed that um, isolates the growing medium both from either contaminated soil, which most cities have, right. or allows us to grow on, on paved uh, land. Right. Uh, uh, these are very common issues everywhere in the world. Um, also allows us to move on short notice, which is, you know, mm. with very expensive real estate, that's a good thing to be able to offer a landowner. Right. We produce 25 tons wow. of food annually. That's considerable. Yeah. Uh, and if you think of that as um, most a lot of greens, uh, that's a lot of volume. Yeah. Uh, uh, we supply uh, about 50 different restaurants, uh, farmers markets, right. uh, uh, and um, so it's you know the scale. If you were to see this, um, which you can from either the train or the walkways, it's it's um, pretty impressive yeah. in terms of its uh, its size. You know, yeah. um, you know uh, the the simple infrastructural challenges of making this happen were significant. Right. Uh, uh, you can't responsibly grow food on most urban soil in most urban soils because they're too contaminated. You right. know. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, pavement provides its own challenges. Sure. <laughs> we came up with a pretty innovative, uh, elegant solution that addresses a number of issues. You know, mm -hmm. with the boxes we designed. They're movable. Yep. Forklift tabs are stackable, nestable, interconnected drains, right. you know, hoops for covering them. So it's right. pretty cool. Right. Very good. All right. Uh, on that note, let's take a break, Michael, and ask viewers to join us on the other side, where we'll talk more about the soul of Soul Food Street Farms. We'd love to hear your feedback. Email us at wideangle at acmi.tv. For information about this episode or to view other Wide Angle episodes, visit us online at acmi.tv slash wideangle. Welcome back to Wide Angle. I'm Peter Bermuda speaking today with Michael Abelman of Soul Food Street Farms about farming as a means not only of feeding bodies, but transforming lives as well. All right, Michael. I think um, certainly the soul of Soul Food Street Farms uh, is the people who have come to work there. So, I mean, you've been there now, I guess, for nine years. I imagine, and, and I recall reading from, uh, from your book, certainly a number of very colorful um, people um, with their own life histories and their own stories and, and um, very compelling stories about their time at Soul Food and what it meant to them, or cont and continues to mean, to put their hands in the soil and grow food. If you would, uh, share with viewers a little bit about the people who, who have come through Soul Food. Yeah, I mean, I, I gave a little bit of uh, uh, broader context to their lives mm -hmm. when I described the neighborhood. Right. Uh, you know, what's one thing that's pretty amazing is um, that we have people employed with us now, who've stayed with us seven, eight years, wow. who probably did not hold a job for seven or eight months prior to that, you know. Right. Um, and I consider that to be success, a success story that most, it's interesting because most social service agencies have a policy of kind of graduating people and moving them on. Mm -hmm. we, we actually have a different concept. We feel like the farms and the community of farmers and what we do is almost like a touchstone. It's a place for people to return to, you know, mm -hmm. some benefit to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Donna, who worked with us for the first four years of the project, I love her, um, her mm -hmm. line. She says, what's the use of being sober if you don't do anything with your mm -hmm. sobriety? Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful statement. Right. Uh, Kenny, who, um, you know, uh, came to us, you know, um, uh, hardcore into heroin, yeah. 
um, our, we consider him to be our first neighborhood farmer. Uh -huh. Says, you know, I come to work feeling miserable and I leave feeling relief and hope. Hmm. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's uh, um, pretty amazing. Alan, Alan, who became one of our uh, supervisors and has become an exceptional farmer, a guy that if I had, when I first met him, when he first arrived, uh, completely consumed by his crack addiction, mm -hmm. I would never have imagined that this guy would become such a successful and productive farmer, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. uh, and supervisor, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 all while raising two kids with their own health problems. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, been pretty impressive, you know, Lyle, Lyle is, um, uh, really an amazing story. Um, uh, you know, Lyle uh, survived the jump off the top of an 18-story building. Oof. He's, uh, you know, he's uh, worked as a produ providing protection services for um, drug dealers and collection services for drug dealers. Right. Um, uh, he's an amazing uh, story. He survived unbelievable mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet he comes to work, um, and, uh, uh, produces good food. He's passionate about what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to look the, the danger of talking about folks is mm -hmm. the, uh, romanticizing that somehow we have, um, created something that has, you know, uh, saved somebody. I, we're not in the business of saving anyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not even, our goal is not even to get people off of drugs. That's not the goal. Mm hmm is to provide a meaningful opportunity for people to engage in, a reason to get out of bed every day. Interesting. And Interesting. Uh, we don't really, um, I, I sincerely believe that whatever um, success, and that's a relative term in the work that we do and the people we deal with, sure. that we have seen, it is the result of the people themselves and their own efforts. You know, uh -huh. we merely set the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we created the space, you know. Uh, provided living soil for people to get their hands in, you know, a community right. to work with, right. a neighborhood that depends on the food, um, a reason for people to show up. You know, right. So, let's shift gears a little bit and and look at um, at some of the very very glaring and obvious economic disparities that, to a certain extent, define soul food street farms, as, as I look at it. Um, you know, on, on the one hand, you're certainly helping um, uh, the city's poor, um, but doing so frequently by seeking funding from very wealthy donors. Um, right. you, sell, you sell, and certainly part of the goal of, of the farm is to, is to produce high quality, artisan, uh, artisan quality produce, and you sell that to very high-end restaurants in Vancouver. Certainly, uh, uh, restaurants that most of your farmers would not be able to afford a meal at. Um, mm -hmm. and, and lastly, is, and, I, and I made a reference to Rogers Arena, uh, one of your, your biggest farms is in the shadow of Rogers Arena, where I'm sure the average price of a ticket is over $100, right? Um, you, are, you are a very conscious person, yes? Uh, you have a social mission for this project. How how is it for you to um, to straddle those disparities and to work with those sort of tensions day in yeah. and day out as you come to the farm? Well, one thing that's really good is at this point, you know, at 63 years old, one thing I notice happens is at, in later years is that things are not so black and white. You begin to see various shades, you know, uh, and and you see gray. Yeah, <laughs> gray is shade. You know? Sure. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, look, we have a very clear primary mandate, mm -hmm. and that is to provide meaningful employment to right. people with barriers, okay? Yeah. And yeah. that employment requires that we, these are paid jobs. These are not volunteer jobs. They're paid, you know? Right. right. So we have to sell the food in order to pay for the jobs, and we're really clear about that. Right. Yes, do we give away? We give away probably, I don't know, $10,000, $15,000 worth of food every year. Uh -huh. But actually, for every 
pound of food I see given away, I cringe because that's money out of somebody's pocket at our, on our staff. You know, mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. I don't support giving food away. Right. But I'm right. clear about our goal. You know? Right. Right. Uh, so the jobs are the primary goal, and as such, we have to sell to those who can pay for the food. We generate about three hundred thousand dollars a year in gross income from products grown and sold. Yeah. We have to raise another three or four hundred thousand dollars a year to support the social piece mm-hmm. of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. um, we are operating uh, by um, serving a the poorest neighborhood in one of the wealthiest cities in the world. Yeah. It's crazy. It's one of the poorest neighborhoods in North America, in right. one of the right. we, uh The contradictions are endless. Right. Uh, I seek out uh, funding from billionaires, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I am not um, conflicted okay. about this whatsoever. I, um, I feel very comfortable with it. I, I feel like I'm giving providing an opportunity to the billionaire just as I'm providing mm-hmm. an opportunity to the person in the neighborhood, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. see myself as a beggar. I see myself as somebody providing an opportunity to, to someone who really needs to do something with the fact that they have more money than they probably should. Right, you know? right. I'm helping them, and I walk mm-hmm. across the city and bring it to the poorest neighborhood, right. you know. Right, right. We don't hand out money we provide jobs and pay the right. payroll right so very good so it's um, but i think i would have to say that um in 2018 which i think we are right now is that right yes any of us would be hard pressed to not on a daily basis recognize that our daily existence is a complete and consistent and continuous contradiction right, you know? right. if you have an ecological or social ethic the minute you wake up, turn on the lights, uh, mm. pour a bath, yeah. eat a meal, you are participating in a number of actions that have repercussions that are not always so positive. You know? sure. Sure. And so we have to live with and accept our own uh, inconsistencies, um, uh, but always keep our eye on the ball. I'm not suggesting we give up. You sure. keep your eye on where you want to go, sure. but accept where you are. You know. And yeah, yeah. Ours is an incredibly imperfect endeavor. I tell people that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, well, you say that, and yet you're coming up, uh, you're, you're almost a decade now at, at Soul Food. Um, my sense is that you would define the business as at perhaps as, as flawed as, as, as you might note it is um, as a success too. So I'm wondering if you feel a decade out um, soul food has met or is uh, a, a good way along in meeting it, the goals as originally established. And if you feel that the model is one which can be used in other locales, other, other cities around North America or, or further afield. It's a good question. I mean, um, look, uh, success is a really in- incredibly relative mm-hmm. term. And especially in the work that we do, addiction is a lifetime experience, and it brings with it all kinds of, you know, variables and uh, uncertainties, inconsistencies, unpredictabilities. You know, I it's a terrible cliche, and, and I, you know, I've heard people use this in describing their own work, but I have to say, it is, I, I, I have to say, it's really true for me that if the result of almost 10 years of our work with Soul Food Street Farms was just uh, somebody like Alan, uh, mm-hmm. who is, you know, amazing to me. He's one of my heroes, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I will feel some sense of satisfaction that we have succeeded. And that sounds crazy, you know. It sounds crazy. I know that we have touched so many more people, and I can sure. go down the list, you know. Sure. Um, but, uh, in the work that we do, you have to look at your achievements as uh, in incremental, uh, stages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the increments have been, uh, hold, holding strong. Yeah. It's good. We've, we've been successful incrementally. Yes. Um, is it a model for other communities? I think that certainly we get, 
people coming to see us from all over the world. Sure. And we, um, uh, you know, even our branding was set up to be able to replicate it. Mm -hmm. However, um, I'm very careful about that one. I now um, feel that the principles of what we do are can be moved around mm -hmm. some of the basic infrastructure, some of the ideas, and mostly the mistakes <laughs> can be can be beneficial. Mostly mm -hmm. the mistakes, and I think the book Street Farm was, in many ways, was more about where we fell short than where we succeed, which I think is more valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is it? Can you actually take this and plop it down somewhere? Probably not. I think that every community needs to um, create a version of this that is unique to their community. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Very good. Um, all right. Now, I'm sure, Michael, that there are viewers out there who are interested in your work, interested in urban agriculture, maybe more generally, uh, creative ways of, of maybe tackling poverty, addiction issues. Um, where should they go to find out more? Yeah, well, look, we have a couple websites, okay. which uh, sure. I will give you. One is um, Soul Food, that's S O L E, S O L E Food Farms dot com. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, you can go if you'd like uh, to Michael dot com uh, because those sites are connected. That might give you a little insight in, as to where I'm going to be and what I'm doing, although we are terrible at updating our websites. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I would encourage you uh, somewhat shamelessly to look for the book Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier. It's a Chelsea Green publication. Exactly. That. Uh, there's another book coming up, uh, coming out, a little toolkit or what, we call, what we're calling a primer, mm -hmm. uh, Farming the City, an Agricultural Primer, which will be out within the next couple of months. Oh, good. Uh, and that, that is available through our uh, our websites. Okay. So uh, and people are welcome to come visit us. We okay. don't do guided tours unless there's a large group. Okay. We have a lot of visitors. All right. So. I thank you, uh, Michael, certainly for joining me today, uh, for the almost insurmountable, but not quite insurmountable <laughs> Skype challenges, uh, and and being patient through that. Certainly for, for writing Street Farm, that's the way I, you and I first, uh, first connected and I got familiar with, with your work um, and for the decade that you've devoted to that project. Uh, I, I think it's an inspiration and I hope, uh, again, although that you, you characterize uh, Street Farm as a, more a collection of the mistakes, um, that people, people learn from that and, and take it to other locales. Peter, thank you so much. Enjoyed being with you. Excellent. Thank you. As my guest today admits, working at a place like Soul Food is not a panacea for those facing chronic challenges, such as mental health issues or drug addiction. But it has helped many find stability and purpose. One crew member reflected on how she found peace every time her hands touched the soil. Quote, I think about my life and what I'm doing with it, she said. The farm is where I come to make choices, it's the right environment, a getaway from the hood." End quote. Of course, the systemic inequalities that allow such hoods to persist are topics for subsequent wide-angle episodes. But for now, might we be thankful for the work of Soul Food and hope that ventures like it, that place human needs above the bottom line, take root in other cities and other lives. On behalf of Michael Abelman, I'm Peter Bermudis. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Wide Angle.